So in 2016, I was preparing for a project and two things happened. The first was that my cousin died. And at her funeral, it was a cousin that I um, didn't see very often, but one that I admired and I cared for deeply. And at a funeral, a cousin from the other quieter side of the family told about how her mother used to take our cousin in as a child to give a respite. Her mother used to wrap a blanket around my cousin and whisper, you are the best girl in 60 streets. I believe my cousin died as a, as a direct result of self-medicating because of domestic violence and abuse. The second thing that happened was a violent and serious crime was committed to a member of my close family. And the trauma at the time was almost unbearable, but they and I and us survived. That was the backdrop to the delivery of a project in 2016, my personal backdrop to the project. We were working with three women's groups. The first group was a group of women living in a hostel providing emergency accommodation in Manchester. And we set up residency in the hostel's canteen. And every night, the women were invited down to join the drama group. And after, the work, every, after each workshop, we sat together and ate a cooked meal provided by two dedicated members of staff. The women created a, a character called Tracy, and they talked about life in the hostel and on the street and time spent in prison. And they talked about their hopes and dreams. And they also talked about how important it was to have access to the sugar bowl. Through the creation of Tracy, there was a safe space created and the women talked about trauma they talked about the trauma experienced due to domestic violence rape sexual assault and childhood sexual abuse at the end of the week we were joined by professor maggie o'neill of durham university now at cork and maggie's research involves walking and we walked with faye faye's work involves sex work for survival and we walked in her shoes to a place of work, past the old oak tree, its branches spread out for Faye to walk over, and how she touched it for luck, and onto the, onto the street and the parked cars. And Faye talked about how she had to make a split-second decision about whether she gets into the car or will he pick up a hammer and smash it to the side of her head. We walked on to Piccadilly Gardens, a place she really goes to, against a sea of people, it felt like a parallel world. At the gardens, Faye talked about her childhood, about her mother leaving and the door slamming, and Faye, age seven, left with a violent and abusive father. At the age of 12, Faye's approached by aftershave Dave, and he offers her 20 quid, and now she's able to buy batteries for a Walkman. Faye loves music, and she breaks into song. The second group. The second group were a group of women in prison, and we met with them once a week in the prison chapel, and they created a character called Julie. And like the other group, they pulled on their own experiences to decide on significant turning points in Julie's life. They were creatively up on their feet. They discussed and they debated. The process is democratic and empowering. There was commonalities with the other group. They had a shared experience of domestic abuse, violence, rape, sexual assault, homelessness, and of course, prison. And they also tried to talk about the loss of the children to adoption, but the trauma was too raw. And they were curious. They asked and answered questions. Did Julie's father know? No, did Julie's mother know that Julie's father was sexually abusing her? And later, they sat with their eyes closed and they talked to the mother. And in the silence, they found the answers to their questions. But we also played and laughed together. And they often broke into song, saying that music gets them through. They talked about their hopes and dreams and what they needed to do in order to stop going back to prison, to stop being the revolving door. They talked about the, their desire to be normal, but that normal is a moving target. The third group. The third group were a group of women on probation in the West End of Newcastle at West End Women and Girls Centre. And they created Annie, and then they called her Poor Annie. Annie meets Paddy. 
Paddy beats and humiliates Annie. So again, we were talking about domestic violence. But with this group, you got a glimpse of how the state plays a role in victimizing and re-traumatizing women. Annie is sanctioned and her children are given to Paddy. Annie is medicated and she's often sectioned and the sun is gray. I remember thinking at the time when working with all three groups about resilience and what's the ingredients needed in order to survive trauma. And I remember thinking back to previous projects when I worked with women seeking asylum, those refused and now destitute. And then talking about the journeys they travel to get here, about crossing rivers at night with their children held high above their heads, a slip and a fall and a baby being lost into the water and a mother's silent scream. I remember thinking, how do you, they, I survive the unthinkable? What does resilience look like? And how come some people have it and others don't, like my cousin? At the end of the workshops, we concluded on a strategy for change. And we asked the women, where do you see yourself in five years? And two of the women from the first group in the hostel said, dead. So we reframed the question. And we said, well, where would you like to see yourself in five years? And then we worked on stepping stones that were needed in order for them to achieve their goal. And through the character, the women said some of the following. They said she needs to get her power back. She needs to love herself. She needs to have boundaries. And she needs support when she gets out of prison. She needs her kids back. Maybe she needs to go to college to uh, retrain, to, to get a job, and maybe do some voluntary work. She needs a women's center. She needs counseling and she needs new friends. And she needs not to go back to the friends that are using drugs and alcohol. And if things go wrong, she needs access to professional services. She needs to have a strong inner voice talk and she needs to be positive and she needs to be believed. She needs accommodation, a home, and not an empty shell. And she needs to let go of her past so she can move forward. I read an article called The Art of Resilience. And in the article, it said that at the heart of resilience lies the belief in yourself. That, resilience, that, that resilient people don't let adversity define them. That they move towards a goal beyond themselves that they transcend pain and grief by perceiving bad times as a temporary, exist, a temporary state. That resilience can be genetic, but it also can be cultivated. That it's possible to support and strengthen your inner self and your belief in yourself, to redefine yourself as capable and competent, to not be immobilized by trauma, and rebound from it. It said that resilient people don't walk between raindrops. They've got the scars to show for their experiences. They struggle, but they keep going anyway. It's not the ability to live your life unharmed. It's not, resilience is not about magic. I wrote three scripts for each of the groups. And it's three stories, and at the same time, one. And the play is called Sugar. I couldn't undo what had been done, but I wanted to celebrate resilience, strength, and courage. And I wanted to name, shame, and blame. Open Class Theatre Company is a women's theatre company. We are feminist. And we support women to make the personal political. And we ask for allies. Sugar's going to be produced in March 2020, and it's going to reach a national and international audience. Open Class Theatre Company aim to change the world one play at a time, and I believe it's time to smash the patriarchy. Thank you.